friends, it's the Starship Trooper coming at you. Little Tommy, Session Man. Uncle Larry, coming at you. How many nicknames do I got, for God's sakes? Hey, uh, uh, Homeschooling, I think it's volume 122. Just wanted to uh, apologize for all the videos I've been putting up lately. Man, uh, not like me to post this much, but I, I, you know, I've just been in the mood to play guitar and I've been putting all this depressing music up. But thank you guys for all the kind comments. Uh, I had a little shopping accident today, kids. Um, I bought this guitar. It's a late 58. One of the cleanest ones I've ever seen. Man, just love at first sight. I'm telling you, man. Um, I sold that Yellow Junior I had a while back, which, which is a fantastic guitar. I already missed it, but man, I found this today and um, I'm really liking it. And I thought it'd be a fun night to talk a little bit about the P90 Gibson thing on these on these 50s guitars, okay? I've mentioned some of this in the past, you know, um, but these P90 pickups are very special on these old juniors, okay? And there's, there's a couple things that they do that, um, you know, I think is worth mentioning, okay? Uh, of course, you got the the creamy, you know, unbelievable rock tone that they give you on on full volume. But when you back the guitar volume down to about six or seven, they have this amazing sort of acoustic guitar property that they take on. That is just no other pickup does that the way that these these clean up right. So I also have a '57 Les Paul Special that you guys have seen me use on, on some videos and. I thought it'd be fun to compare these two guitars so you guys could hear the difference between, you know, a 58 Les Paul Jr. with the big dog ear cover and a 57 Les Paul Special with the smaller soap bar, as they call it, cover, which is the same pickup, just a different cover. But So here's the, I got a little bit of delay and, uh, you know, little, it, it just a little bit, of, just a tiny bit of nobles going through this old 50 watt Marshall. Okay. I was talking to a, to a friend of mine tonight about this phenomenon that these guitars, I've had a pile of these old juniors in my life. I call it the click. They do this thing. You can actually hear the plastic cover of the P90s when you pick a note. It adds this sort of really cool percussive thing. You can hear it acoustically and electrically. Like, like. <laughs> down to seven and look at this. And then when you got that last couple numbers there on the volume is just like a pedal you kick on. It just goes to from acoustic guitar to just soaring, you know, Gritty, gritty rock and roll tone. So these were, you know, as we all know, Les Paul Jr., these were student model guitars, right? They were, they were never intended for, like, professional guitar players, you know? Single pickup, wraparound bridge, very simple design, you know? But, you know, obviously, guys figured out that these were great rock and roll guitars in the 70s, and, uh, so here's the 
the old Les Paul Special so you can hear the difference, okay? This is a great guitar, I've had it for a while. I really love this guitar. Two P90s, right? Same pickup, but these just have the dog, you know, the, the soap bar covers, right? But I always thought these were incredibly versatile guitars because what you can do with these two volumes and these two tones on these P90s is just lovely. I mean, I've always said that a P90 is the most authentic sounding pickup of, of all of them, you know? I'm not saying they're my favorite. I love P90s, but they're the most authentic honest rock and roll sound and pickup of, of any of anything even more than a paf in my opinion you guys can argue all you want about that but i mean you know people complain about the noise with these sometimes because they are a bit noisy but as far as just the the purity of the non-hyped you know rock and roll tone that a p90 gives you there's nothing that can touch it and uh i'm just going to use the bridge pickup only on this guitar because it would be unfair to compare it you know, to a single pickup guitar, but here's the bridge pickup. pieces alone doesn't make it on a p90 you've got to get the whole body of the pickup up so you can see i shim these pickups get them up real high see like humbuckers i don't like to have them real high but p90s you got to have them high and you can't just jack the pole pieces up it's got to be the whole pickup right sometimes on les paul juniors they're actually too close to the strings you know because there's not a lot of clearance there for the if you like your action low you got to I've had to recess the pickup into the guitar a little bit on certain other, you know, with the right neck angle or the wrong neck angle. So, um, this is a whole different animal. This is, a, you know, another solid piece of mahogany, uh, but they are different, you know. Uh, check it out, I'll play up. And this this thing also does the acoustic guitar thing when you, when you turn it down, check it out. This is at seven. <laughs> say that this guitar does the acoustic guitar thing that the junior does but not quite to the extent that the junior does <laughs> caps that they use in the wiring, I'm not totally sure. But both just amazing guitars and, um, you know, uh, I mean, I, you can't go wrong with one of these. I mean, uh, an old, uh, an old piece of, you know, Honduran mahogany with a P90 in it, how bad could it possibly be? So answer a few questions, because we haven't done the VCB in a while, because all I've been doing is 
playing all this depressing music. Um, people have asked about those Music Man cabinets back there. It's a funny story I'll tell you about. They keep growing, yes. And I, I've always had an obsession with those old Music Man cabinets. Um, I'll tell you the whole story. Um, you know how, like, when you're a kid, whatever you get turned on to when you're a young kid just sort of stays with you and you get this sort of sentimental thing as you grow up? My brother, when I was real young, had a music store uh, for that lasted for about a year in Cleveland, Ohio. It didn't last very long. But after it closed... Um, he took a lot of the brochures and things that were in the store and he put them in a filing cabinet at my mom's house. So when I was little, I used to like crawl through that filing cabinet and I would look at all these brochures. I remember catalogs for Guild and, you know, Music Man, but this catalog is amazing. And man, I used to look at these pictures of like these Music Man cabinets and I thought to myself, Oh my God, these are the coolest looking things I have ever seen. This catalog is amazing, by the way. You guys ever look at old catalogs? Total nerd, right? But it's fun. But yeah, look, I mean, look at that. So that's my explanation for the obsession with the Music Man cabinets. I've had a couple questions lately about, and yes, I do use them and they sound amazing, by the way. Um, I've got a 115, a 210, and a 212. Um, Another guy, another guy sent a question that I've been pondering lately. Um, I've sort of been thinking about how to answer it, but he said, what's the difference between a good guitar player and a great guitar player? Which is a, kind of a, you know, a silly question, but there's a lot to it, right? I mean, um, I answered him in, in the text, and I can't remember exactly what I wrote, but it was sort of a perfunctory view of it. But I, I say that it has to do with that last 1%, you know? I mean... Um, the difference between good and great in anything, sports or anything, usually comes down to that last couple percent, right? Um, there's this thing that happens uh, in that 98, 99% that really becomes special, you know? You know, I've talked many times about, about touch and, uh, you know, phrasing and all the things that make it you know like a real musician not just a guitar player but a real musician has to have these things but I've said phrasing is the most important thing touch is the most important thing you know listening being able to conjure the perfect thing to play at the right moment given the circumstances around you these are the things that I've seen great musicians do right um there's a lot of things that go into it, but I think the touch, phrasing, and just the general full court awareness of what's happening in, in in a song, you know, on a gig or on a on a session, those are the things that I that I look for in a in a great musician, you know. Um, there's a lot more than that, but but okay, so I'm going to go off on one last thing. Okay, I've talked about this before, and I'm going to reinforce this one more time. Okay. People have asked me to critique their videos where they're playing a solo or something like that. You know, I, I, I am on the gear page. Yes, I do occasionally look at that. And people have asked me to, to you know, to, to look at some of their videos and, see, and, and wonder what my opinion was, whatever, whatever. That's fine. But I, I notice the thing it, it, that I notice when I'm looking at a guy play I, I ask myself, is he playing with his fingers or is he playing with his brain in his in his heart? Okay, sir, sir, like an average guitar player, an amateur plays with his fingers, and a great plays with his heart and his mind and his brain. Okay, that's the difference. You can you can always tell. Okay, there's a lot of guys that have learned how to get, you know, real comfortable with their patterns and their shapes, and they're so used to playing things a certain way though. Don't just let their fingers fall where they play, you know, where they will fall. And it sounds good. It sounds like guitar. But that does not move me. That I, can't, I don't like that kind of guitar playing where you can just tell a guy's fingers are just falling where they normally fall. Because if you gave them that same piece of music and took the guitar out of their hands and told them, and told them to sing a solo, they would never sing that. Okay, I'm looking for guys that sing while they're playing, right? That's what I try to do. I, I try to 
ignore the fact that I'm a guitar player and don't just let my fingers fall where they're used to falling. I'm trying to find things that are sometimes uncomfortable to play on guitar, but they sound amazing, right? You, when I'm about to play a solo in the studio, I've talked about this before, I, I, I won't just pick up the guitar and start playing. I have to listen to the track, Tell, play me the bit where I'm supposed to solo and let me listen to it, you know, several times. And I want to picture what could be there, you know, I, I, I want to uh, imagine what could be there. Like I'll sing things in my head, I'll get a picture of what I want it to be like, I'll picture a tone. And then I, then I pick up the guitar and I start fishing out what I was singing in my head. And sometimes it gets altered when I actually get the guitar in my hands and I'll try to play what I was, what I was imagining. And sometimes it doesn't work. And then you got to sort of change it a bit. But most of the time, at least it starts you on a path where you're getting to a good place. You know, I noticed when you go to fish something out, if you're playing something that's that's not comfortable to play on a guitar, that's a good sign. That means you've created something interesting. Because if you just go like this, it's not interesting, right? Um, it can be interesting if that's exactly what the song needs. But like when I did that Paul Davids video, you know, uh, where all the different guitar players played over the same solo, that's what I did. I just, I didn't play anything. I just listened to it. And I pictured what could be there. And I had, that melody came into my head, you know, and uh, and uh, I was just like, well, that's what it needs to be. So then, then he decided at that point, what kind of tone does it need to be? I originally pictured it being like um, a wah sound, like an envelope filter. I was picturing it being like, the melody was like. And I was picturing it being like. But then I tried that a few times and I just couldn't get it to sound the way I wanted to. So I just started getting like a more regular guitar tone, you know, normal, and it worked. But, you know, these, and then sometimes you're working with a great producer who can, who can help you. Like you start, you throw an idea out and they go, oh, that's a good bit, but don't do that. You know, you, what if you did this instead? You know, you go, oh yeah, great. You try it and then like collaboration is always better than just one guy trying to do um, the thing by himself, right? Collaboration is actually my favorite part of all music, to be honest, but yeah. So, I mean, if I could get any, any advice to guitar players, I would say play with your heart and not your fingers, you know? You, you know let, I mean, we all have to know our shapes and our patterns and all that stuff, but, but if that's all you're doing, if you're just letting your fingers fall where they're because of muscle memory, then you're not really playing guitar, man. And, and I think that's the, that's the case with like 99% of all amateurs I see is that they just, you can tell they're just, playing with their fingers they're not saying anything right and uh man you know i'm not saying that uh it has to be slow and soulful to be good i mean i like all kinds of guitar playing i like ripping guitars i like but it's just got to fit the song and it's got to be what the song needs man and it's got to be what the people want to hear right that's the most important thing um uh i always joke around the studio i just say you know give the people what they want to hear, you know, that, that's the thing. I mean, that goes, you know, like drum fills and stuff like, I mean, there's certain things that we all want to hear, man. I mean, if a guy tries to get too tricky with his drum fills in certain places of a song where it's supposed to re-enter, it's like, dude, what are you doing? Just give us, you know, let's, that's what we want, you know, give it to us, you know. Yes, it can be cliche, but it's also great when it's done right. So I want to say, uh, you know, again, thank you to all who have bought the Plexi Soul album, the Trip the Witch album, and check out that website, man, Guitar House, because there's all kinds of stuff on there. There's this Plexi Soul shirt, you know, direct, it's called a direct transfer, fancy shirt. Um, and then Drew's doing good over there. He's, he's busy packing up... Uh, Oh, you know, I want to tell you one more thing, too. Uh, there's been a lot of problems with Australia. Like, uh, people have said that they're having a hard time, like they can't ship to Australia. But Jed Hughes' dad has offered to have a bunch of CDs shipped to him, and he would he would post them out, you know, from Australia. So that's what we're going to do. I'll, I'll be in touch with the link about that. If you're an Australian and you want the Plexi Soul record, 
Um, all right, guys. I'll be uh, seeing you real soon. Over and out. Merry Christmas.